Greetings to all our listeners. Welcome to Sustaining Sustainability series by Eva India Insights podcast, where we illuminate pressing environmental issues in observance of World Environmental Day. I'm Pallavi, your host for today's enlightening dialogue. We have the distinct honor of welcoming Nitesh Mehrotra, the Eva India partner in sustainability and ESG practice. With over two decades of experience, Nitesh excels in creating robust ESG frameworks and evaluating ESG performance across various business models. A pivotal member of EY's global sustainability executive, his expertise is sharpened by esteemed programs and certifications from leading institutes like NCR, Stockholm Resilience Centers. Nitesh's vision for sustainability transformation is both expansive and urgent. Aspiring to match the scale of the industrial revolution with the pace of our digital era, ultimately delivering value to every stakeholder. Today, we will navigate the climate science challenges and pathway India faces and also exploring strategic mitigation and adaptation measures. Welcome to the show, Nitesh. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Pallavi. Uh, it's great to be here and, and I look forward uh, to our conversation on, on such an important and critical topic. Thank you, Nitesh. So before we deep dive, I, I want, I mean, could you share with us listeners on the need for urgency on sustainability discipline for our planet? So as we all know, uh, I think climate change and social inequity are the biggest challenges uh, faced by humanity today. Uh, uh, so, so let me start uh, sharing with our listeners a quick refresh and perspective uh, on this uh, covering uh, both where we are today uh, and, and I think more importantly, where we are heading. Uh, uh, so I think if you look at our overall planetary compass uh, as, as, as you know, 20 odd thousand scientists have been analyzing that with a lot of data, uh, I think starting with climate change and global boiling as, as United Nations has termed it, right now we are at about 1.2 degrees Celsius. Uh, at the moment, uh, all of us in the country are facing the heat wave, so we can all relate. We have just seen what's happening in Brazil and East Africa with the impact of climate change. And uh, just a reminder for all of us, uh, you know, the world came together in, in Paris in 2015, and we agreed to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, or well below 2 degrees Celsius. A and I think, uh, uh, as I said, we are already at 1.2 degree plus minus. Uh, but where we are heading in this century is about three degrees Celsius. And I think that's the latest point that we need to be considering uh, for the need for urgent action. Uh, and, and this is considering all the pledges, NDCs, commitments that the, that the governments and the companies have been making. So uh, clearly uh, a need for urgent action on, on the climate. Uh, I think uh, if I were to talk a little bit about social uh, aspect, uh, you know, believe it or not, uh, there are about more than 50 million people uh, still living in modern slavery. Uh, and as per uh, International Labour Organization, 85% of those are still in the private sector embedded within the supply chain. So uh, uh, again, a, a cause for real worry and change. Uh, and uh, connecting to all of that is in terms of the uh, you know, especially on the climate, the impact of GDP uh, that we all analyze uh, in 2022 was about 1.8 degree. But importantly, where we are heading is about 10% of GDP at risk uh, due to climate change annually. Uh, so put this, uh, you know, in all perspective, uh, I would say, uh, you know, we need about three to about four or five trillion dollars yearly on both adaptation and mitigation uh, and if you were to go by 10% of GDP at risk, uh, the world GDP is at about $100 trillion, so about $10 trillion of GDP at risk. So uh, as we all say right now, it's still cheaper to save the world uh, than destroy it. Uh, uh, so I think it's quick perspective for, for your readers, Pallavi. Thank you, Nitesh. That's a very strong existential case for our survival. Not sure if we need to create any for the business case around this. Moving on for India Inc., what is your research highlighting on the overall impact and awareness on the subject? Uh, I think that's that's a great uh, point, Pallavi. So uh, we've been uh, analyzing, uh, I would say, 
you know, with a lot of data, uh, uh, with a lot of credible data that's available at the moment, uh, uh, in terms of what's the overall India's GDP exposure uh, and population exposure to the climate risk uh, that that we touched upon a little bit, and then as you said, also on the India Inc, the leading companies. Uh, uh, you know, how they're aligned to UN Paris Agreement and also the mitigation and adaptation plan uh, that the companies are taking for both climate and, and nature change. So I'll start with the India's GDP exposure. Uh, so I think if we were to look at the GDP exposure to wildlife, flood, sea level rise or storms, uh, uh, the percentage exposure to India's GDP is at about 50%, right? So it's a massive exposure uh, uh, to the country, and and we have further analyzed in terms of the GDP exposure to agriculture land at risk of water stress. We all know water is a big big challenge in the country, and and that's at about 30% uh, 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 at the moment. Uh, 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 and uh, and I think if we were to look at the the other scenario that we've analyzed is, is in terms of uh, the population exposure to heat waves. Uh, uh, that is also very significant at about 40%, and we're all uh, seeing the impact of the heat waves uh, at, at the moment uh, in, in the country. So uh, a significant point, and I think the point to drive is that what is the adaptation and mitigation measures that the country is taking to adapt to that? Uh, moving on, I think we've also analyzed uh, uh, how is India Inc. aligned to UN Paris Agreement. Um, as I said, in 2015, that was a landmark agreement. And we see uh, about 56% of the Indian companies are still strongly misaligned to Paris Agreement as of now. So they are about three degree trajectory. Uh, and only 25% of the leading companies in India are aligned to the Paris Agreement. So obviously, again, a need for urgent action. Uh, we've also been analyzing the mitigation and adaptation plans the companies are disclosing, talking about for climate. And uh, our data shows that there are fewer than 100 companies in India uh, that have uh, at least publicly disclosed uh, some of these plans and transition at the moment. So again, I, I think a important cry for action that needs to be done to make sure uh, we uh, mitigate the risk uh, and and uh, make sure there are no surprises, uh, you know, to the to the leading companies in the country. Thank you, Nitesh. Building on the previous question with effects to climate change becoming more apparent, India faces a unique challenge and opportunities. Could you begin with giving us a further perspective on the primary climate risks that India is currently facing? Yeah, so probably building on to, uh, I think what we touched a little bit earlier, uh, I think overall, if I were to see India faces a very tricky balance uh, because we need to boost the living standard of our 1.4 billion citizens uh, while still adapting, mitigating, uh, you know, to the climate change uh, uh, aspect that we touched upon. Uh, and 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 I think I'll also highlight that it's very pertinent to to, to note that India has been through various uh, you know models been ranked the world's fifth most vulnerable country. To climate change and and the reality is uh, i think we are obviously one of the lowest per capita consumption of uh, of uh, energy and greenhouse gases uh, and uh, uh, you know to the point that we always say that people who have done the least uh, will bear the most brunt uh, which is the poor population and uh, and and we are at the front line of, of this uh, uh, change that is uh, coming at the moment uh, and uh, I would also say I think it's important, and and I tell our our uh, you know folks from Global North, especially that uh, it's it's important to know that three fourth of the country is still to be built, uh, and and I think that's why the India's challenge to reimagine its policy and system in a sustainable way uh, that doesn't leave its people behind is is very very critical, and and that's why the cry for just transition. Uh, as we call, so that uh, our, our our adaptation, I would say, more importantly, has to be nuanced uh, to the global south and and uh, what's needed uh, for our country in India. Thank you, Nitesh. Um, for our listeners specifically, would you want to share any uh, leading framework for climate-related risks or opportunities and financial impact? 
Yeah, uh, Pallavi, absolutely. So I think, again, there are a lot of frameworks, but one of the most leading frameworks uh, is certainly uh, a, a framework, again, at the cost of using uh, an acronym or jargon. It's, it's called TCFD, uh, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. Uh, and again, the, the reason I'm mentioning it, it's 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 a it's a mature framework uh, which most countries companies are adopting. Even RBI has now uh, uh, asked uh, you know the financial companies to adopt that into their into their frameworks. Uh, and this TCFD framework has uh, it's it's a relatively simpler framework. It has four layers, eleven recommendation, and as I call it, this the TCFD onions. It talks about that how we are. Uh, embedding climate change uh, in our strategy, I think, which is very critical uh, from a business standpoint. How are we embedding, integrating into our risk management, uh, the ERM framework, how we are embedding into the governance, uh, because tone at the top, as we all know, is very critical. And what are our specifics, uh, meaningful metrics and targets that we are uh, that we are that we are disclosing, as well as obviously monitoring uh, on an on a real time basis. Uh, and also just to uh, you know dive a little bit it it does talk about uh, two pillars uh, on the left hand side uh, obviously on the risk because that is what we need to mitigate and adapt to and and within risk uh, you know it, we talk about the transition risk uh, as as the world is transitioning and also the physical risk uh, uh, you know that's coming from the climate change uh, at the moment uh, uh, but also, I think it's important to note that there are a lot of opportunities that may also come. And I think from an India standpoint, uh, one could argue that given the state that we are in, three-fourths of the country is not built, uh, could we build differently? And I think hence a lot of opportunity for us, uh, both in terms of energy transition, our, our agriculture transition, uh, and also... Uh, you know, uh, uh, be in terms of new product and services uh, and a new model that we could uh, show uh, to the global north. So I think, again, uh, we need to obviously focusing on risk and opportunities. Uh, but more importantly, I think what this framework talks about that, how do we really translate the risk and opportunity into our financial statement, right? Because we all know what we can't measure, uh, we can't really improve and, and track. And I think that's why uh, this concept of... Uh, making sure this relatively fuzzy concept of climate change, we bring that to our financial statement uh, in terms of our PNL, balance sheet, cash flows, uh, so that we can then think through and, and take meaningful uh, decisions and capital allocation as we move ahead. Thank you, Nitesh. Uh, now pivoting towards uh, digital, how can emerging technologies like AI create real-time alerts for both risk and opportunities? Yeah, I think it's a very important question, Pallavi, and I, I guess no conversation is complete without uh, without AI these days. Uh, uh, but but truth be told, uh, obviously, uh, I think uh, we've been looking at it uh, in terms of various use cases that the emerging tech, digital, and especially AI and Gen AI uh, can, can help accelerate uh, this transition and mitigate. And uh, uh, while there have been a lot of use cases, everyone's been doing a lot of pilots, but I think we are seeing really mature business cases uh, that are emerging to accelerate. And, and I would like to share with our listeners just few uh, which are relatively mature and, and I've seen our clients really leveraging and, and create value. I think the first one is clearly, uh, you know, the data discovery. Where is the data? How do we really look at interdependencies uh, uh, and, and, and also look at the trade-offs? And and that the whole aspect of data discovery, as, as I call it, I think AI can really make it simpler and, and accelerate uh, with that. Uh, I think the second theme is, uh, you know, certainly on uh, the modeling of the climate scenarios and predicting uh, what's going to happen. Because truth be told, while we have data, we're still not able to predict uh, where the risks are with, with, with the relative uh, accuracy. And I think that's where this whole aspect of geospatial AI, as we call it, there are about 200 odd satellites uh, tracking uh, climate scenarios at the moment. Uh, as, as some of your listeners may know, uh, there's a new satellite that's going to track methane going forward so that we are able to create a lot of transparency on, on, on the data. So I think predicting climate scenarios is certainly a great use case that companies are starting to embed. And, and the last, uh, and, and certainly not the least, I would say, where I've seen some leading companies make great uh, progress at the moment 
is on the supply chain intelligence because uh, I think a lot's being done in terms of plucking the low hanging fruits as we call it on uh, on the four walls of the organization. But we all know the supply chain, uh, both upstream and downstream, is where the change needs to be driven. Uh, you know, from from a from large company standpoint. So I think uh, having the traceability of data and again uh, strengthening resilience through AI on on the supply chain is, I think, a great uh, business case that is being driven uh, leveraging uh, technology. So I think these are just few, uh, uh, Pallavi, just for your listeners that that I wanted to share. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nitesh. Your insights have been invaluable in understanding the complexity of climate risks and the actions needed for sustainable future in India. Thank you, Palavi. It's been a pleasure and uh, thank you for having me. And uh, hopefully we could provide some, some good context. And, and I would say again, at the cost of repeating, uh, the need for urgent action that that needs to be done uh, to make sure we both mitigate the risk and, and also create opportunities uh, for a more sustainable world. Thank you, Nitesh. And thank you to all our listeners for tuning in to this important conversation. Together with the right knowledge and action, we can create a resilient India in the face of climate change. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast for more discussions like this. Until next time, stay, stay informed and proactive about our planet's health. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye.